of us who can't join can still benefit. So welcome so much. Welcome to everybody for coming to this webinar and for, for joining me today to learn more about the QSO Challenge. I'm sharing my screen with you. Um, I have most, most of you are muted because um, it's just sort of easier than the background noise and that sort of thing. Um, please type in the chat box if you have questions. I'm going to open that so that we can uh, have a dialogue there. Um, I'd be happy to answer your questions as we go along or at the end, uh, I'm happy to do that. And um, like I said, I'm recording. Oh, and just to, to lay it out, this is a, a, a presentation about the QSO Challenge, which is a fundraiser for QSO. It's not really about volunteering or that kind of thing. If you're interested in that, I can um, pass your information along to a colleague of mine. But today we're gonna talk about the QSO challenge. So let's get started. I can see um, we have we have 28 people joining us, so that's really great. So let's carry on. Um, okay. So let's let me introduce myself to start out with. My name is Amy Gibson. I am uh, the uh, I was the fundraising officer here, but I am now the senior philanthropy officer at QSO. I've been here for six years. I did go, like I was saying earlier, I did go on the trip in 2018. It was an amazing time. It really was a transformative experience. It was great to see QSO's programs and to challenge myself uh, on this trip, um, really a trekking uh, experience, which was, was really wonderful. Um, I have over 15 years of fundraising experience. So this is the field that I've chosen to be in and have had such great success with. Um, all of the folks who have been on our trips in the past have been so very successful in their fundraising and have done allowed QSO International to do so much uh, as a result. So um, I'm really excited today to tell you more about the trip and what it involves um, and uh, how you can be a part of it. So let's first talk about QSO International to just give you a sense of, uh, of our organization. We've been around, most of you know, we've been around since 1961. QSO has been working to reduce poverty and inequality through the efforts of our partners, our volunteers, and our donors. And all of the funds raised from the challenge will be directed towards QSO programming to allow QSO to continue to um, do and, and take part in its, pro its programs and uh, alleviate poverty, to advance gender equality, and to really uh, provide economic opportunities for vulnerable people. And that's really um, our mission and our goal. So you can see the quote there that says, it's a wonderful opportunity to challenge yourself while raising money and awareness for a great organization. That was Clara. She was a 20 year old from my 2018 group who was so excited to be a part of this and be able to, to give back to an organization that she had actually heard about in school and had followed us along for some time. So. Um, Let's now talk a little bit about QSO in Peru. Uh, we have a long history in Peru, in fact, and we've been helping local partners and working with local partners in the Andean region for, for quite a number of years. So by joining the challenge, you're helping women and girls gain the skills they need for lasting employment and really promoting sustainable economic development and strengthening Andean way of life there. Um, the challenge, currently works in both urban and rural areas within the Andean regions and with partnering countries uh, or sort of bordering countries in Bolivia and, and Colombia as well. What I think is really exciting about this trip specifically is the partner visit. And you'll see on your screen there, those photos of, um, of women weaving beautiful products. Uh, we had the opportunity to go uh, to a, uh, to visit a partner that we're working with about an hour outside of Cusco. We got on a bus and we uh, went out there for the day. The partner we work with there is a women's ecotourism cooperative and it's uh, this lovely group of women, such strong independent women who are bringing tourists into their homes from the cities surrounding into this rural area uh, in a small community on a lake with mountains, like it's the most picturesque place, beautiful lake and mountains in the background. And what they do is they draw tourists to come and stay in their homes. And um, like I said, in the picture, they're doing a weaving demonstration. They dye the alpaca wool and they weave beautiful things, tablewares, bags, scarves, clothes. 
and we got to have a beautiful lunch. They, they taught us all of these things. We had, they prepared the most amazing lunch for us. We got to ask questions and really understand uh, QSO's impact there. And we had a volunteer working in the area as well. And they, the volunteer was helping them with getting their business up and running. So they were working on um, marketing their business and getting their homes up to speed so that they could host uh, a North American tourist in their homes. And then all a part of what they did when they when people come to stay, they really um, shared their skills in weaving, their gastronomy, their farming, their traditional medicines. Um, all of those things were a part of the experience when you stayed there, and it was just a real immersion into the culture, which was was so great. And by bringing tourists into the area, it really means that the women can contribute to their families. They can bring in an income outside of what their husband brings in typically, and they can stay in the home and really raise their, their children so that the women all band together and can um, support each other. So the partner visit really gives you an understanding of what life in Peru is like, and it's quite impactful and it's so worthwhile. And I think it really puts the whole trip into perspective. Um, we do this trip uh, or this day trip to this partner visit on the Monday and the next day, we, we hit the road and start our trek. And uh, I think it puts you in a really great headspace going into that, that trekking and sort of puts things into perspective. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm going to uh, move now to sort of the details about, about the trip. So what is it all about? It's CUSO International and Charity Challenge. So, our organizations have partnered up together. Charity Challenge um, has been a part of uh, this trip since the beginning. We did it in 2015 and in 2018. Everyone completed the trip. We had a wide range of ages. We were looking to really grow the event this year. So we ex were excited to have more people join us. But CUSO works with Charity Challenge. They're really a reputable organization out of the UK. They're our tour operator. So they look after all of the sort of details of the trip in terms of planning um, the route and the details of the sites that we see and all of those things. And I can attest to the quality uh, because I was able to go on the trip in 2018 and the organization and the professionalism shown by the guides, the doctors, the country staff, the porters, everybody was um, incredible. And, and on top of that, they, are very responsible in the tourism that they do. I think that's something that's also um, sort of meaningful for me as well, that they are partners with uh, the Rainforest Alliance, with Climate Care. Um, we actually sign a document that says, you know, we're not going to pull the plants out and we're not going to walk off the path and we're not going to take things home and, and that kind of thing. So um, they also have guidelines around their porters and what they can carry and how long they work and all of those things. So I think it's a very responsible company and one that that we're proud to partner with. So that's that's Charity Challenge. They're really the organizer side of it and we're the, the charity side of it. So what is it? It's trekking, it's camping, it's exploring. We're learning things about Peru and we're sharing this experience with each other. I think it's uh, it's. It speaks for itself. It's it's such a wonderful trip. And then why? It's a personal challenge, really. Uh, oftentimes, people don't get the opportunity to, to go on something like this. And I think having it organized, especially in the world that we live in now, having having being able to have, be walked through an experience, I think is really um, comforting and, and it's a great opportunity right now. So it's also awareness raising for us. So in the fundraising that we do and in the outreach that we do around it, um, we really want to spread the word about QSO and what we're doing um, in Peru and around the world. So um, where it is, it's out of Cusco, Peru. So uh, that's the sort of base of where we start the trek. And then it ends up uh, on the, the last day in Machu Picchu, and then we end up coming back to Cusco again. But Machu Picchu is certainly the highlight. And it's happening September 24th to October 2nd this year. And you can join us. So you can join us uh, by booking your spot before September 17th. Uh, that is sort of the cutoff uh, right now. So um, I hope that you'll consider joining us. I have another quote here from Sandy. So Sandy is Clara's mother. So that from the other quote, 
She says, it's a remarkable personal opportunity to see a different part of the world and explore another culture all while engaging and supporting in a very worthy organization. That was a mother-daughter team and they were just spectacular. So that, that was something fun um, that they got to do together. Okay, so now let's talk about a typical day. I'm, um, I'm gonna leave lots of room for questions uh, at the end of this as well. So I, I'm gonna give you the basics and then I've made sure to leave room for, for questions that we can get to um, uh, at the end. So let's, let's talk about a typical day. This is my favorite picture of the little llamas there. Uh, so the a typical get day does start early. It starts at six, well, maybe not for some, 6.30. We wake up. Um, I'm going to talk about a, a hiking day, like a trekking day. That's a, a day where we're uh, in our tents. We will be trekking each day and staying in tents. So we would get up at six. Uh, we would um, get brought coffee or tea in our tent, which is very luxurious. Uh, we, uh, we don't have to worry about setting up or tearing down our tents. So that's the other thing is we, there are porters that are able uh, to do that. Um, and, uh, so we also, uh, have a therma rest provided. So the, the tents and the therma rest are provided the sleeping bag and pillow and your personal items are things that you bring. Nope. Um, you have a lovely breakfast, uh, we can fill up on water. You have snacks prepared and, um, you leave camp at about 8 AM. And then you don't carry your bags. So you, the main part of your bag, so your clothes and your toiletries and your sleeping bag and pillow and that are not what you can, you don't have to carry those in the day. All you're carrying with you is a day pack. And in your day pack, you would carry your water, your sunscreen, your camera, your rain gear, and that sort of thing. Um, all of your other items get taken to the lunch spot. So it gets moved ahead uh, leapfrogging with you uh, through the help of the staff. And then you walk to your lunch, basically, and lunch is set up ahead of you uh, in tents. And then the, uh, the lunch is lovely. Uh, they have a hot lunch for you, which is was also really nice. And then you have access to your main pack at that time. So if you want to change your socks or pull out a different sweater or those kinds of things, you can swap your clothes and things at that time. After lunch, you can trek to the final camping spot for the day. Tents are set up, dinner's being prepared. Uh, you'll get a lovely hot chocolate or a coffee. Um, there's often a snack before dinner, uh, chips and salsa, things like that. Um, and then um, you have a lovely meal. I'm gonna talk more about the food, but you have a lovely three course meal that is amazingly prepared and delicious. And then um, they give you a, bo a, a bowl of water at the end of the day in your tent so you can wash your face and clean up a little bit um, at the end of the day because there's uh, not showers on those hiking days. So we're hiking generally between six and eight hours a day and it's not strenuous in that um, you are going very long distances. The the thing about it is it's the altitude, I think that, um, like when we say we're going maybe 10K, it's, it's not, 10K could be relatively easy, but it's because the altitude is a challenge for our bodies that makes us go slower, take our time, take more breaks. And so it sort of draws out that day. So um, there's lots of stops, lots of breaks, um, lots of photo opportunities and things like that. So um, that's sort of what a typical trekking day looks like. I also want to talk a little bit about the staff. So there are two local guides. There's one main guide and then there's additional guides on the last day. So I can speak to this photo here. So the woman in white is our doctor or was our doctor at the time. The gentleman in black was one of our guides. And then the other two ladies were additional guides that weren't on the rest of the trip. They only came on the last day because Machu Picchu requires you to have a certain number of guides based on the certain number of people in your group. So uh, we had a few extra folks uh, guiding us. And the guy, the person on the, the far right is, uh, was one of our guides as well. And uh, we have a doctor. So like I said, there is a doctor, there's medical staff that are uh, there to 
react to anything that happens. We didn't have any, we haven't had anything major happen on a trip before, but they're always there monitoring. They're, they're there for, uh, in case you need it, basically. There's also cooking staff and porters. The staff is amazed. Like I can't say enough about the staff, uh, what they're able to accomplish camping. I love to camp, uh, but my meals when I'm out camping are nothing compared to what they're able to uh, provide there. And of course the meals uh, in the restaurants, we go to lots of lovely restaurants in uh, Cusco as well. So there's, there's lots of good food and I'll talk about more that a bit more. Uh, they really pick up your spirits. The other thing about them is they're so knowledgeable. So they're not only encouraging you, but you can ask them questions and they're a wealth of information in terms of what you're seeing. So the historical impact of like what's in front of you, they're able to really um, let you know sort of the, the, um, the traditions and the significance of uh, what you're seeing. And, and I think that's invaluable. Okay, so let's talk about the food because it's lunchtime and that's always a good topic, right? Food is always important. So it's three course meals and they can accommodate any kind of food allergies or special nutrition requirements, um, vegan, uh, vegetarian, gluten-free, all of those things can be accommodated. And um, water on the, the trekking or on the hiking days and at the hotels is provided. So that's something that you don't have to worry about. And it's a three course meal. So you get a hot soup to begin with. You have a hearty meal of chicken or rice or potatoes. Um, and then you have a lovely dessert at the end as well, if you can manage it, because it feels like you're eating a lot. You're working very hard. So um, they build the meal plan so that you get enough calories and that you are keeping your strength up and that you have the energy each day to do what you need to do. So they've uh, considered all of those things. And they don't get too adventurous. I think that's a question that I get quite often is how adventurous is the food? Am I going to have authentic Peruvian food? And on the trekking days, on the days when we're camping, it's, um, it's very much a North American, uh, they cater to a North American palate. Um, they want to make sure everyone stays healthy and safe and, uh, you know, have the nutrition that they need to, to do uh, the trip uh, to make the, the trek. So um, there are opportunities to try more authentic, uh, Peruvian food on the days when we're not trekking. So that's still an option when we go to hotel, uh, to restaurants and things like that. So, um, that's sort of one of the questions that I get in terms of accommodations. Um, we have very good accommodations in, um, in Cusco and, uh, in Aguas Calientes when we get to Peru. They're basic hotels that are clean and safe and in good neighborhoods and are close to things. Uh, so I have uh, nothing but good things to say about that. And then um, for three nights, we're in tents with, uh, like I said, sleeping pads. You bring your sleeping bag and pillow. And that too is also quite comfortable. Actually, I can speak to the picture here. You, if you look at that, uh, the picture on the bottom right, you can see the four tents that are joined together. That is the uh, dining tent. So that would be where we would eat our meals. And then the blue tents and the uh, burgundy and gray tents, those are our sleeping tents. So those, that gives you a sense of what it, is, what it looks like. And it is double occupancy. So there's two people per um, hotel room or per tent. Now let's talk about training and, uh, and our fitness. So um, if you're fairly active and you're moderately healthy lifestyle, you should be good to go. Um, I think the thing is the endurance is key. So hiking takes place at altitude. It's at uh, 4,400 meters. So we do recommend training and to increase your cardiovascular endurance. So by working on your cardio, you're going to help uh, your uh, recovering heart rate. And that's just gonna allow you to uh, feel more comfortable when you're at altitude. So by doing a bit of physical activity and training prior to the trip, you're going to improve your recovery and you're gonna feel probably much better while you're on the trip. And when you register, Charity Challenge actually provides you with a training schedule that you can follow. And it's uh, six weeks before, it sort of lays out a six week, or sorry, a 16 week plan. Uh, and it starts basically with uh, 30 minutes of walking three days a week. 
and then it builds sort of up from there. And that's a, a 16 week plan. Um, I think we're about 19 weeks out now. So um, that kind of gives you a sense of, um, of, of the training schedule. In terms of training, I have a couple of tips. Hike in your boots. So whatever you're going to wear on your feet, don't buy them a week before. You want to hike in, your, in the boots that uh, you've been hiking in for some time so that you don't get blisters. You want to wear your backpack when you're hiking because you want to make sure that it's comfortable, it fits, it's not chafing you, it's, uh, it's what you want. And uh, when you're training, try and go uphill. So at any point, if you can try and build that in, there's lots of up and downs where we're going um, on this trek. Um, and so I think uh, building that into your, to your, your training plan is important. In terms of age, we've had age ranges from the age of 20 to 70, and everybody has completed the trek just fine. So it's not, it's less about your actual age, and it's more about your physical endurance and um, what you're used to, I think. So um, that's, uh, that's that. In terms of um, the fundraising portion, um, let me just skip to that slide. Okay, so um, I'm here to help you with your fundraising. There is a fundraising component to this, but we provide you with a, um, a fundraising page as well. So um, it's something that's sort of built into the trip and into the costs, and I'm here to help you facilitate your fundraising and achieve your goal. Everybody has achieved their goal up until now, so I have no doubt that, uh, that, that you will do the same. So. Um, I do have an example of what a fundraising page looks like. This is an online fundraising page for someone who is going on the trip uh, this year. And I can help you design this. Um, I, you can personalize your page. You can tell people why, why, why you're motivated to do the trek. You can share photos. You can email your network and let them know what you're doing so they can support you. Uh, and then, like I said, I can coach you along the way and I can help devise a plan that really suits you and suits your network. Um, and then sometimes participants choose to pay for the fundraising fee and that's okay too. So uh, if you don't wanna fundraise, you can choose to pay that and you'll get a tax receipt for that portion. Uh, all of the donations received for the trek are tax receivable. So uh, people will get uh, a tax receipt that they can use. A past participant of ours said that fundraising was the easiest part. It's the trek that's the hard part. <laughs> so uh, that's, uh, that's one anecdote that someone said. But uh, we do have 12 people registered already, and we've raised $32,000 up until now, and we hope to really grow that. Um, like I said, everyone has met or exceeded their fundraising goal so far. So I have no doubt that, uh, that we'll be able to exceed that. Okay, so let's now talk about what's included. So all the accommodation during the challenge is included and it is double occupancy, it's a twin share. And your three meals, so all of your meals from when you get picked up at the airport until you get dropped off at the airport, all your meals are uh, included. What's not included is alcohol or if you want additional meals. The drinking water on all of the challenge days uh, is included. The entrance fees to the national parks and the historic sites that are on the itinerary are all included. The ground staff that I talked about, they all speak English, their uh, they're guides, their drivers, their cooks, uh, the medical staff, um, all of that is all included in the price. And the backup support as well. So there are medical staff and first aid supplies and anything that you may need uh, in, in, in those terms as well. Um, Activity equipment included are tents and sleeping pads, the rest, so your shoes, your um, personal items, all of those things that are things that you would bring. And tips are not included either. So that's one thing that is not included in the, uh, the challenge. So any additional food or gifts or things that you wanna purchase uh, are not included. Okay, so let's talk about the cost. Now that we know what it is we're paying for, let's talk about the cost of, of uh, how much it costs. So there's two models that you can choose 
and they're slightly different. So e for each model, we uh, require a deposit of $750 at the time of booking. And then eight weeks before departure, which is about July 30th, you, re you are required to pay your balance. So in the self-funder model, it basically means that you're paying more of the costs of the trip yourself and you're fundraising less. So that means you're paying $26.50 for the trip costs. And like I said, that includes all of the things, the ground transfer, accommodation, food, passes, guides, everything. Your flight is not included. Um, and then each person uh, fundraises $2,500 for CUSO International. And like I said, the tools and support are available for that. And then for the flexi funder model, basically means you pay less in the trip costs, but you fundraise more. So maybe you have, you know, you have a network who can support you. You may choose this option. You pay sixteen fifty in the trip costs, and uh, you fundraise four thousand for Cuso International. So you can really choose whichever one suits you better. Um, and like I said, tax receipts for all donations, support for the fundraising is provided. Um, and uh, I'm happy to help devise a plan with you uh, to, to help you be successful. Uh, so those are the costs. Okay, let's move on now to, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about staying safe uh, in this climate that we're in and the world we live in now. Um, I can tell you that our top priority is keeping everybody safe and healthy. You know, we do not want to take risks. We're not going to do that. Um, we want to make sure that everybody is safe and healthy and comfortable. So, um, and I can't speak to what the conditions will be or the requirements will be in September because we know we live in a changing world and things happen and things change. So, but right now we know that we require a PCR test 48 hours before entering Peru. This is for Canadians. Uh, I'm not sure about people overseas or, or in different places, um, but we do require a PCR test 48 hours before entering Peru. They do require you to be vaccinated, so that's something that they will be checking along the way. There are no other mandatory vaccinations. There are some things that you may want to look at, things like hepatitis or yellow fever or things like that if you don't already have those, uh, but those are not mandatory. And you may also need to show proof of your vaccination when you enter indoor spaces and things like that. So that is something that still uh, happens uh, in Peru. While we're in country, we're also going to be conscious to be following our public health measures, what we've been doing all along, wearing a mask, whether we're on transportation or we're indoors or we're in crowded spaces, we're uh, wearing masks and we're uh, washing our hands and using hand sanitizer when we can't uh, wash our hands with water and we will be trying to physical distance. So keeping all of those measures in mind as we go along. And then in terms of entering Canada again, there may be some requirements uh, at that time. There may not be, it's hard to tell at this point, but um, Charity Challenge has committed to ensuring that we have the appropriate testing at the hotel before we leave. So that is something that they will look after for us um, and coordinate for us. It's not something we have to uh, worry about uh, upon our return to Canada. So um, I hope that that, um, that may answer uh, some questions. I do see a question that came up, is double vaccination sufficient? And I believe, yes, it is. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that, that it is, uh, double vaccination is okay. Um, and uh, let's move on to my next slide. So uh, registration closes uh, June 17th and you can join at any point up until uh, that. It's, um, there, that means there's a little over five weeks to register. And if Machu Picchu has been on your bucket list and you've been thinking about it, this could be the time, this could be the moment for, for you to do it. I know we have a really great group of people that have already joined us and you can buddy up, you can sign up with a friend, you can sign up with a coworker, a family member. Um, we have had moms and daughters on the trip. We have a group of friends who are celebrating their 50th. Um, birthday, we have um, couples, we have seen all different uh, folks sign up, we've had individuals sign up and make lifelong friends. So um, if you're interested at all, please feel free to reach out to me, I'm happy to answer any additional questions, anything that I didn't cover, I'm going to cover some of them now, but 
um, I'm always here as a resource if you if you need anything. Like I said, I, I could talk about this probably for far longer than an hour, um, but, <laughs> but for your sake, I'll, I'll keep it to the highlights, but um, feel free to contact me. My information is there. Um, I'll leave that up on the screen and I'm going to um, shift to my messages. I see Tina has been compiling some messages for me. So thank you, Tina, for doing that. I'm going to uh, touch on some of these now. Uh, Annie says, what are the, what is the weather in September, October? I see folks wearing light jackets. Yes, that's true. It can get cooler in the evenings and in the mornings. So oftentimes we would start with a few extra layers and be peeling. And so by the time the sun comes out and it's on you and you're walking and you're making your way, you're peeling off the layers and it's quite warm. But as soon as the sun disappears, it does get quite cool. So um, I think they say 10 degrees is um, what they say the average temperature would be uh, overnight and that sort of thing. So it's definitely a, a jacket scenario. And maybe um, I think I had a toque at one point uh, in, the, in, the, um, in my tent just to stay warm through the, the, the night, but it's not freezing cold at all. It's, um, it's quite moderate compared to, to where we are here. Um, I see a question from Betty, is there cell phone or data coverage? There is some cell phone, it is spotty. So in the cities, definitely Cusco, yes. Um, even at Machu Picchu, I think there was coverage. We are hiking in quite rural areas uh, on our way to Machu Picchu. So uh, it can be spotty at times. So during those days where we're camping, so it's, it's um, three nights and four days of camping. And during those days, there's, it's spotty, but, um, but you're not definitely like, uh, there's not, it's not a case that you're completely disconnected the entire time. Uh, can you make a donation for the fundraising portion and receive a tax receipt if you don't want to fundraise? Yes. It's a great question. You can definitely just make a donation yourself and get the tax receipt and get the benefit. Yeah. When do you have to choose the funder plan upon registration? Yes. Thank you, Lori, for that question. You can, uh, you, we would prefer that you, uh, make that selection when you register. It doesn't mean that you can't switch, but I think there may be fees involved with switching. So as much as possible, try and choose the one that you want to do. Um, Charity Challenge may charge you for switching between the different funding plans. So be aware of that. And um, if you want more information on that, reach out to me. I can, um, I can follow up with, our, with Charity Challenge and see uh, what they say about that. Um, what happens with some physical limitations? Carolina, um, if you have physical limitations, it is quite strenuous. So uh, depending what your physical limitations are, um, that would be a call, I guess, that you could make. But um, if you're up for being on your feet for, a, for six hours, for, for a, a long day of, not a long day, but a full day of hiking, it definitely there are breaks and there are times to stop. But um, we are on our feet for some time. Uh, if, if that is um, okay for you, then I would say that it would be all right, but I can um, I'd be happy to chat with you more about specifics and, and have a sense of, um, of what that could be like for you. Um, I have a question that says, if you raise 5650, would the trip be free? Well, um, the not necessarily. So the fundraising portion is uh, four thousand, or it's twenty five hundred, and the rest is um, if somebody wants to pay for your trip costs, that's up to you. Um, I, I wouldn't uh, say that that money is coming to QSO because it's not. It's going to pay for the trip. Um, but if you need help paying for the cost, then that's something that you could work out on your own. I would just hesitate from um, saying that that is actually supporting QSO because it's really paying for, for the costs. But thank you for that, that question. I live in Victoria. Do I get myself to Peru and meet you there? 
or do we all need to leave from Toronto? Cynthia, okay, thank you, Cynthia, for asking that question. Um, the flights are, um, are up to your discretion. So that is something that you cover the cost of and you can coordinate. So if you wanna come early or you wanna stay later or um, uh, you know, make certain arrangements, you can do that. And if you don't wanna come through Toronto and you have a different route that you wanna take, you can certainly do that. So um, that's really up to you to, to decide. Um, you don't have to come through Toronto. Basically, we need to just all be in Cusco on the, on the Saturday morning. We're all going to, or whenever your flight arrives on Saturday, we all meet in Cusco that Saturday. And that's when things kick off. We all meet together. We um, get to know each other a little bit. We get to go for dinner and, and really sort of um, break the ice a bit. Um, so as long as you're there in Cusco that Saturday morning, that's all uh, you can coordinate what suits you best. Um, Cynthia also asked, what's the maximum number of people you will expect? Oh, accept, sorry. Uh, we can do up to 30 people, but if we have more than 30 people, we can actually add another trip on to this. So in a lovely best case scenario, I would love to be able to add another trip and have an even larger group go with us. So um, we can have up to 30. Um, when I went on the trip, we had uh, 17, I think. Um, so uh, that gives you a sense. Thank you for your question, Cynthia. Um, this project organization started in the 60s. Is the need and poverty issue still as prevalent today? Yes, I. Uh, that's a great question. Yeah, I... Um, what successes have been made in the 50 years? Oh, wow, many successes. Uh, well, yeah, so this is a great question. Thank you for asking it. Um, the, the poverty, the need still does uh, continue. There is so many challenges in so many of the countries we work in. And uh, we know development is a long-term uh, game. It really is something that we've been working long and hard on. And we certainly have seen so many positive stories come out of the work that we're doing and real impactful change that CUSA has been able to make. And I am happy to follow up with you on what those specific details are. Um, I can get back to, to all of you, in fact, uh, about what those are. It, it's, um, it's probably too many to mention at this point, but um, I would... I would love to tell you more about our successes. Um, we, can, we can talk about our programming um, in Peru and what we're being able to do with women and girls there and women's empowerment in Peru. I can tell you just from the group that we went to visit uh, the Women's Ecotourism Cooperative, the, the way that they are able to um, be prepared for um, their country opening back up and being able to accept tourists again, I think, is going to be transformative for those families and their ability to make an income um, just because they've had some support from CUSO and some, some guidance on um, building their business. I think that just in that one example, um, it's transforming those women and their families and the community. So um, I can certainly get back to you with, with more about those, those specific things. We will, but I just wanted to add the whole COVID um, um, pandemic that we've just come out of. There was a lot of programming around that, but to Amy's point, there's so much programming within Peru that's been effective over the years that we would like to be comprehensive in our response. And so we'll touch base one-on-one -on -one with you in regards to um, some of the impact that's been made in Peru. And so Amy, I think you do have a couple of more questions in regards yeah. to the trek specifically. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thanks, Tina. Thanks for saying that. Um, yeah, I love that, Betty, you asked this question because it's one that I get all the time. What are the washroom facilities? Outhouses? Trees? <laughs> this is great. So this is one that I think everyone wants to know. What's the washroom situation? So um, when we're trekking, there are, it's, it's not, so let me just start by saying it's not as bad as you think. I like to camp. Um, so maybe somebody who doesn't is terrible, like, freaked out by it but really in in a word it's a composting toilet that is in a changing hut that you'd see at the beach 
So basically, um, the the washroom is set apart from the tents and the every everything else. You have to walk sort of a distance over to it. It it's a zipper. It, it's faced the opposite direction to provide additional privacy. So the entrance is facing away from the camp. It's a zipper. You go in, there's a composting toilet. There's in fact water. So you can do your business and push the button for water. It you see nothing, it flows down, you hit the button, it all goes into basically a tank bucket situation. That gets changed quite regularly. The the staff help with that. And it's really not that bad. So that part of it um, I was pleasantly surprised with. That's when you're at camp and that's at lunch um, and when you're at camp in the evenings and in the mornings. Uh, when you're trekking, it could be a different story. Uh, you, I mean, we're all, the thing is we're all in the same boat. So we all have the same situation. If it's a case that you have to go in between um, breakfast and lunch, you can, the group will hike ahead. One guide will kind of hang back, but not too close. And then you can um, sort of do your business in private behind a rock somewhere, dig a cat hole and uh, do that kind of thing. Um, we haven't had any, any real issues with, with that, but um, I'm glad you asked that question because I guess it's great to be transparent about all the details. And while we're um, camping, there is um, very, well, no shower facilities either. So that's the other thing. Um, the, the, there, we had one shower facility that was very basic, uh, on, in one of the camp, uh, spots that we had. So the it's, uh, I brought wet wipes and did that kind of thing. So that was the, the sort of shower situation, but thank you for asking that question, Betty. Uh, cancellation options. Do we have cancellation options given personal health or family issues? Thank you, Lori. Um, there would be insurance. So we would encourage you to have insurance that would cover anything, any kind of cancellation that would happen before departure. So uh, that would be, um, and I believe there is a, um, another part of the cancellation would be if you could replace yourself with somebody else, then that would limit the fees that you would have to pay for a cancellation. So if you could some sub out somebody to take your spot, um, that would eliminate, I think, most of the cancellation um, fees. So, um, but that's a really good question. Will this trip be offered at a later date? Do you offer trips and challenges to other destinations? Well, right now we don't have any other challenges on the books. Uh, this is the main one that we really want to, uh, to garner support for and to, to get a full group. Um, so we don't have one on the horizon just yet, uh, but I'd be open to your suggestions. Where would you like to go? Um, do you have uh, anything that uh, sparks your interest? I'd love to hear your feedback on that. Um, we've talked casually about other destinations. We've been to Peru. This will be the third time. If there are other destinations, I'd love to be able to take a group to see uh, some of our other work in other countries. So um, if we could get a group together, it wouldn't be off the table, but um, we'd have to be sure that we could get sort of a, a group of people that, that could come and, and uh, make, it, make it a good worthwhile trip. Um, Successes would be helpful and a useful tool for fundraising. Yes, you're right. Sharing our successes and the work that we're doing. Um, very specific, tangible things I think are great to be able to share uh, would be helpful for our fundraising. Absolutely. And those are things that I can provide you with. Um, I can, we, can, we can show your donors exactly what their funds are going to support and the types of things that they're um, that their, their money is going towards. It's really um, something that, that I can provide for you. Absolutely. Great. I have, I think I see uh, a question about, do we have to book our own passes for the Inca Trail? No, we don't. So the passes at, and all of the other historical sites that we go to are all booked through Charity Challenge. So those are not something that we need to book on our own. 
That's a good question. Thank you, Janice. Yeah, I'll just say there might be some questions that are going directly to you versus everyone, yeah. Amy. So um, yeah. just have a double check with that because I there's yeah. no more questions in well, the in the well, um, well, everybody uh, Q and A. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, sorry, Amy, I have a question. Can I ask? I didn't put sure. it. Can I ask you? Okay. Go ahead. Coming to the main trek. Yeah. Right uh, now, you mentioned things like four thousand four hundred meters. You start up from ten thousand feet. Six to eight hours a day, right? Now yeah. we come to the main trek. So, what is it going to be like? It's going to be a constant climb, a constant climb, and then what? You reach a certain peak and then come back. So that's totally six days. Because <laughs> I see walking sticks. Uh, <laughs> yes. Pictures. We, yeah. 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 Show okay. the of the map. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not uh, it's not just one uphill. So each day okay. it's rise yeah. and fall over the course of the day. Oh, okay. And then we camp in a valley and then we would go again the next day. And it okay. all culminates in uh, uh, arriving at Machu Picchu. So on the last day, it is quite uphill to get to Machu Picchu and we get to come through the sun gate, which is kind of the back of the site. Mm -hmm. And it's the most beautiful thing that you get to come through the gate. It gives me chills just thinking about it. You get to look down on the site. It's beautiful. And then you walk from the very top point of the site all the way down to a bus that takes you into town. So on that last day, you do do a quite a bit of uphill, um, but then it's a downhill into town. So um, it's not a constant uphill the entire time. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you for your question. Yeah, and you you need uh, the support sticks to walk. I think oh, they're uh, helpful. It is slippery. I mean, it rains. Therefore, it you mean on a rock, the feet could slip. You mean that's why you need the sticks, is it? Yeah, it it can be helpful. It's just sort of a stabilizer. I think when it does rain, it does get slippery because it's it can be quite mossy. It's not very tree because of the altitude. It's not very treed. So it's quite like low scrub cover and moss. So it can get, um, can get slippery at times, but it's just easier on your knees as well. So as you're going up and down, the trekking poles really do take a significant amount off of your knees and uh, make it a bit more comfortable and it stabilizes you as well. So um, some people choose to do that. I use them. I found them very effective. I, I don't use them here, but uh, I found over the course of, of those few days, it did make, did make sense to have them and, and I did find them beneficial. There's a few uh, more general uh, questions. Uh, okay, well, uh, Chuck, really if you could, um, sorry, if if I'm just trying to manage the questions and um, we're trying to keep the talking to a minimum if possible, just to give equity to um, everyone who's participating. Um, if there's a question, maybe you can type it to me myself and I can um, support you in getting the response from Amy. That would be great. I do see some other questions here. So um, the day-to-day -day itinerary is definitely available. Uh, thanks, Lizanne. We can send that to you. There is a very detailed itinerary that talks about where we're going to be at what time each day. Um, we arrive, you know, on the Saturday, we all get to know each other. Sunday, we do an acclimatization hike. Basically, they get on a, we get on a bus, they drive us out to the edge of Cusco, and we walk back into town. And that's really to acclimatize, get used to the pace, get used to the altitude and your breathing and how that's going to all be managed. And then um, on Monday, we go to see the partner on our partner visit. And then Monday, we set off trekking. And then we have, uh, we have four days of trekking. And then we're at Machu Picchu. I think one of the other things that I failed to mention is we arrive at Machu Picchu at the end of the day um, on Thursday. And then on Friday, so then we go down into town and we stay the night. And then we get up the next day and we get to go back to Machu Picchu and walk around the site. So we actually get to be there twice. We get to arrive there. And then the next day we get to actually go on a tour and see in detail the site and all of the, the amazing things that are there to see and get interpretation from our guides and things like that as well. So um, you get to visit the site twice, which is really, really special. Um, so that gives you a little bit of a sense. And then we, uh, on the Saturday, we take the train home, uh, home, home to Cusco. And, uh, and then we, we leave from there. So that 
I will send, we have a written up uh, detailed itinerary that I can share with you. Um, are there photo of the hotel destinations? I can provide those for you as well. We do, I can, uh, they have websites that I can, I don't know if we're going to be staying at the same ones that we stayed at when I was doing, when I went on the track in 2018, but uh, they will be of that same quality. So you can get a sense of the quality of the hotel. I'm happy to send those. Um, if next steps, so what are the next steps? If you decide to go, I would say you could, um, you could reach out to me. I can provide you with the link to register. Uh, and uh, I can pro I'll provide the link to register in an email after this with the recording. And you can click on that link. You would go to the Charity Challenge website and put your deposit down. They, that will secure your spot on the trip. And then, um, like I said, eight weeks before, you would pay your deposit and start your training. And you're off and running after that. So that's sort of the next step. Um, conf I'm confused about what type of luggage we require. It says a suitcase uh, for a second, but then a, a backpack of some sort. Okay, Janice, good question. So I was confused by this too. You can bring, you can bring a suitcase when you travel from Canada there. When you get there, they're going to provide you with a black bag. So it's like a duffel bag. And everybody puts their things into these black duffel bags. And those black duffel bags are the ones that the porters take. And they're all the same and they're, they're uniform. They have our names on them. And um, it just makes it easier for the porters to manage the bags when they're all the same and they know what size they are and they know they have room for everything. So on the trekking days, your stuff gets put into these black bags and you can leave your, um, your main suitcase at the hotel for those trekking days. Um, and it will be safe and, and locked up and secure um, so that you'll only just have your sort of black bag and your, your day bag with you on the trekking days. So that's kind of how that works. I wasn't 100% clear on that when I went as well. And that's, um, that's kind of a good way to do it because you know how much room you have in this black bag and uh, you can put your whatever you need in it and um, they can transport it most easily that way. So. Um, that's the, the luggage question. That's a great question. Thanks for asking that. Uh, what are the conditions of the porters? Does the company we hike with make sure they have port proper conditions? Great question. I was just looking at that this morning. 100% yes. So they have, there are guidelines on the Charity Challenge website, um, their UK website that um, outlines uh, the conditions for the porters. They are very conscious. They're all local, um, local folks that are porters. They employ local people. Um, and there certainly are like proper accommodations. I think there's um, time spent working um, limitations on that, um, on weight that they can carry and things like that. Um, and so the health and safety of the porters is absolutely important and not only the porters but the food staff and the guides and all of the people um, that make this trip possible are well looked after in terms of the proper conditions that um, that they're given and are paid fairly as well um, I think one of the other questions that I get that I could answer is you know how much money do I take what what do I do about money and um, it depends how much you want to shop there's lots of opportunity for wonderful shopping. Um, but part of that is also um, at your discretion, you can tip the staff. And what we did when we were on my trip is we pooled our tips at the very end. And we had basically a little ceremony thanking all of the staff that were there uh, helping with the food, the, the setting up, tearing down, moving us, uh, guiding us, all of that. And we got to really thank and um, acknowledge the hard work that they put in. So we, I think we did um, $50 per person, all went together, and then it was divvied out accordingly to the appropriate people. And um, that was for the, at the very end of the trip, we, we had that ceremony. So that was a really nice way to sort of end things off and really thank them and show our gratitude for their support along the way. 
Well, great. I think we've had um, a lot of really great questions. I see one more about what about bringing small souvenirs to hand out to children or staff? We did have some of that happen. Um, I don't know if I can comment about whether that's appropriate or not, but it has, some people did choose to do that um, and felt like they wanted to, to do that. Um, some people um, supported in some of the smaller communities would give uh, small donations to people that they saw as well. That's up to your discretion. Um, there's no real policy on that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I want to thank everyone for joining me today. I appreciate your questions. I appreciate your interest and your, um, your attention for this hour uh, over your lunchtime. I really appreciate it. Um, if there are any additional questions, my email is there. I'm happy to follow up with mm -hmm. each of you. Um, and I'll send out an email after this with the recording and uh, some more details about some of the things we talked about today. So just, thanks just everyone. Go, yeah. Just before you go, uh, should we bring money, in, US money uh, for the tips? Good question. Yes, uh, it is uh, US money that, um, they do not take Canadian at all. It would be uh, converting your things into US. Okay. And uh, you can do that there. We did that there. The guides took us to a reputable uh, exchange place where we could go in and get um, a rate that was um, appropriate and get our money changed. Um, mostly uh, it's a US um, okay. is what is accepted and uh, credit cards at most uh, other places in terms of mm -hmm. like shopping and stuff like that. And I didn't notice, but was the cost of the trip in Canadian or U.S.? It's in Canadian. Yeah. Okay, good question. Perfect. Yay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. No problem. Great question. Good. Uh, is there an opportunity? One minute and there's one more question. Yeah. Is there an ahead. opportunity to meet the group online or Zoom before we all meet in Peru? Yes. So I do look forward to hosting one or more sessions um, with people who who register, who are interested, who, who are gonna be joining us on the trip so that we can meet each other in advance. We can talk about our training. We can uh, get to know each other, figure out you know, what, who's bringing what and how, how, what their expectations are and um, answer all the questions and things like that. So yes, I do hope to bring the group together uh, online before we all meet in Peru. So yes, I look forward to doing that. That's uh, that's going to be an exciting one, and we can talk more about all the details around, you know, specifics of what you're bringing and um, money and uh, gear and all those things and and training and stuff like that. So yeah, I look forward to that. Thanks everyone. Thanks for joining me today. Take care.